Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still on site in Brooklyn, New York. We are gonna be talking about realigning technology with humanity's best interests. And we have with us Max Stossel, hello. Good to meet you. Just kidding, good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again, my man. I'm super pumped to talk about this. This is one of the most pressing issues of our time. And Max's background is perfect for this. Let me give you the breakdown. He's a multi-award winning storyteller, poet, and filmmaker. He is four years as the founder of Words That Move, and you've probably seen some of his videos. We'll link them in the bio, things like This Panda Is Dancing, Subway Love, and Stop Making Murderers Famous. Also, three years as the head of education at the Center for Humane Technology, which is what Time Well Spent morphed into, and that's, Really, in, this is really interesting because Max also came with an eight year background in social media strategy for Fortune 500 companies. So he was building out um, these, these persuasive technologies that we see. And so now he's made this move into the, into, into the light side. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm super pumped to talk to you. This is, uh, we're gonna be talking uh, again about the super pressing issue that we have as, as uh, technologies permeating everywhere into our world, but we are kind of like, we find ourselves ethically as kindergartners with godlike powers of technology. So tell us about this kind of, <clears throat> this big history understanding of things as we find ourselves as stewards of the earth with these godlike powers, but we haven't really evolved our ethics quite yet. Um, one example of this that feels relevant that Tristan Harris, who's the leader of this movement in many ways, describes often is that he was in the room when they decided that like a Gmail notification should, an email should give you a notification. Um, and to him that felt like something that, wow, like two billion people are all of a sudden very frequently per day going to have their attention diverted in a specific direction. Um, and it didn't seem like there was very much thought that went into whether or not that would be the case. Um, and so all of a sudden technology here, especially mobile technology, smartphones, social media, for the first time we have a handful of people and mostly in Silicon Valley who are deciding how to steer the attention of two billion people every day. And that's unprecedented. Um, and that comes with tremendous responsibility that I think it's never been, it's never been the responsibility of corporations to think so deeply about the ethics because there's never been so much power or so much control. Yeah, when, when you put it into the uh, big picture understanding of two billion people's attention being moved based on decisions at a corporation, that, that gives us a better understanding of holy crap, um, that's a huge deal. And, <clears throat> and we're checking these devices, I think on average 150 times a day. Yeah. And so two billion people 150 times a day, how much human attention um, is being controlled there. And we have trouble understanding a term like two billion. And two billion is, I believe, about as many Christians as there are in the world. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And those are the biggest religions, Christianity, Islam, and um, yeah, and there's... Uh, it's a lot of people. That's a lot of, <laughs> a, and 150 times a day it's being moved too. So that's a lot of c uh, collect, you know, you're building up the amount of attention. So it's not just 2 billion yeah. seconds, but it becomes way more seconds and minutes totally. because it's 150 times a day. Yeah. It would actually be interesting to calculate how many like days of our, like how many days, years per day, things like that. I'd be interested to see yeah. how much time is spent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> and I've went to serious extents to um, to not be manipulated by it. So I have all my notifications off on my device. I have all my uh, apps are just deleted from my device. I <laughs> so I've I've went really hardcore cold turkey on it, and it's um, been extremely helpful for me to stay really focused um, and executing on what I think is most important. What's Th what's that experience been like? It's been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so what did you, did you deleted all of your apps? Yeah. I, yeah. I have like, you all of your I apps? have like, I have like audible, <laughs> Okay. you know, like to listen to books. Cool. Yeah. And I have, um, you know, like, uh, e I have email and text. Right. Yeah. 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 I have email and text you and Google all maps the social and media Uber. apps. Yeah. But have most of the utilities. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Phone? That's Got it. it. Yeah. Most of the utilities, but not no social apps. Got it. Um, and that's been, and that's felt good super good okay, cool. I'm way more focused and uh, and 
and just all notifications off is also very important. That way you can, um, you look at your device and use it as a one-way communications tool instead of uh, people Having interrupting yeah. you and yeah, yeah, especially uh, getting dragged into the uh, social yeah. media. Is that including platforms. text and email for you or those things? That's including text and email. Wow, cool, yeah. that's rare. Yeah, I get no notifications on my device. It's fantastic. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's that's... like the best thing ever. Cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so good. At different strokes for different folks, but I recommend uh, exploring that as an option yeah. because uh, that's often focus. in terms of, and a lot of this is about you know we do these specific things in an effort to not be manipulated, as you put it, or controlled. Um, but at the same time, it's it's almost impossible to escape the reach because, especially about how we see the world. Because even if we're not doing any of that in our phones, anytime we are getting information from social media, that obviously is coming through a specific filter. And then even if we're not, chances are we're interact you're interacting with me right now. I'm still using some social media, so I am influencing. It's like I'm influencing you in some ways. The people in our lives influence us very deeply. So it's almost impossible to fully escape. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And so we really need this sort of systemic change of help steering our focus, our attention towards the things that matter to us. Yes, um, yes. And so like it needs to come from there, but it's cool to hear that you've taken that much control and are happy with it. Um, yeah. And I definitely yeah. recommend to people, it's like, yeah, exp like try a week. Exactly. Try it, like yeah. what, if just try for a week yes. something new. And if that works better for you, then great. You should do that or think about how to integrate that into your life. Yep, yep. There's a bunch of different ways for this uh, realigning technology better with our humanity that we're gonna explore in conversation. And you said one of them's yourself to grab the, the, horn, the, the horns of the bull and guide your own use by these, um, <clears throat> these quant quantified self shifts in your own life and see how it, um, how it affects you. And then there's the corporate and there's the um, government side of things. There's a bunch of that of things that we're going to explore. Um, <clears throat> Max had this really interesting quote um, in one of his talks that he gave. He said that um, we have a greater uh, proclivity to want to rule these worlds that we're going to create, these virtual worlds, than we do to want to uh, like co-create and live participate. and participate in, in this one. I want you to talk about that a little bit. <laughs> See, it's in one of the poems. Um, it's funny, I can almost never just quote in the middle of my poems. I have to start from the beginning, so I don't know exactly what that quote is, but it's something like that. Of, yeah, it seems that we're so eager to have control over these new virtual worlds. Uh, it seems that we oftentimes are forgetting about this one, right? And some of that is that it's so much easier, especially from a business standpoint, to measure success in clicks, likes, scrolls, actions that we can track um, than it is to like measure success out here. How like how am I doing? How am I feeling? How satisfied I am with the way that the world is and the way that I am acting in that world? Um, it's really hard to measure that. It's really hard to think about that. Um, and this is one of the things that a lot of when I speak at schools, a lot of the the young boys are very, like spending a lot of time gaming. And like cool, I gamed growing up yeah. and. I would go on like 17 hour halo benders. Yeah. One thing I tell them is that I think if I would really check in with how I felt, the first hour, I was like, this is awesome. The next 17, I was in a fit of rage, just like desperately needing to get to the next level. Yeah, I don't yeah. think I was actually feeling good. Um, but it's so much easier, especially in adolescence, um, to be measuring our success based on, oh, like what level am I at? Look, this ha game, the game has a level. Like there's a clear yeah. metric of like, I can control this and I can play more and I can get further along. Life doesn't work that way. Like life is not a very clear, like I'm at level one and then I go to level two and then this happens at level two. Like things are not guaranteed in that way. It's much more nebulous, much more complex. So I think in some ways in the digital world, because it's easier to measure of like, the action that we take and then build whole systems around that, we lose sight of the bigger, less easier to measure, much more meaningful and fulfilling picture. Yeah, yeah, the, the escapism into virtual worlds is, oh, is something that I think about quite a lot and I think um, we are gonna want to be these rulers of these virtual worlds um, more so than participate in the world that we have here. It's uh, when, uh, Tristan talks about this as well. When a bunch of monks came to Google, um, it was like a very obviously interesting site that you see. And their biggest concern was that it's never been easier to run from ourselves. That like the moment oh, yeah. things get a little bit awkward or a little bit uncomfortable right. or a little bit hard, it's just so easy to just sort of 
run, run from ourselves to the digital world because it's just a click away, just a grab away. Um, and so it's, but so much of meaning and fulfillment in life comes from being a person, processing what we need to process and not yeah. running away from all of our little challenging emotions um, and problems. Not that some escapism or entertainment isn't also Is helpful, also like helpful? finding the yeah. balance, different totally. for everybody, but um, certainly it's not running away from it all the time. Damn, it has become so much easier to just jump to the digital world every time we feel a little bit uncomfortable or um, uneasy. Like, we got to face those fears. We got to face those uncomfortabilities. We have to see how they feel and process them and talk with other humans about them because that's how we learn and grow. Yeah. Um, but when we escape out of them, we never learn how to actually grow um, socially, emotionally. Yeah. Okay. So... All right, this is, there's kind of a th three parts to, to what the Center for Humane Tech is up to, um, that you wanna, you're explaining how technology is hijacking our minds. You're then helping build more humane tech through different methods, and you're helping people live more intentionally with their devices. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I would describe it as, like that's certainly one, um, one way of looking at it. Uh, it seems like the different pillars are um, the big sort of four or five organizations that steer so much human attention. Um, and is there a way to successfully impact the way that they are steering attention for the better and to make those practices more humane? Um, another is just general awareness, uh, like letting people know that we're being hijacked, uh, like trying to steer uh, how we tell this story towards like that as human beings, there just are certain vulnerabilities. There's like Tristan talks about this in the way that magicians are able to fool you is that because like whether you're the president or whether you're somebody who's like sitting on the street asking for change, there are certain ways that your mind works. And so that's why magic works on people because there are vulnerabilities. And so since we have these vulnerabilities and we have technology that can exploit these vulnerabilities, can we build tech not that exploits them, but that protects us from um, ways that we're naturally, naturally vulnerable? Um, and so spreading awareness of that possibility and like making the average person know how tech is affecting us and how um, these vulnerabilities affect us in different ways. Uh, and then, yeah, and so and governments are another pillar. Uh, I don't personally have much involvement or any involvement with in the organization, um, but it seems like government's going to be involved in some way, shape or form one way or another. And so advising on what that might look like uh, and yeah, and I won't be particularly helpful in what the answer to that question is. I don't yeah. know. I'm very wary of governments, um, but it's that is definitely one pillar of the organization. And I wonder what ends up becoming most effective because the corporate has billions of attention eyeballs. So the government <clears throat> can be tough to sometimes figure out how to best regulate things like this. And then really this grassroots idea is really strong, but it's hard for people to look in the mirror at themselves and make changes in their lives. Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's honestly, that's the awareness side is where I personally am most focused. Uh, with Center for Humane Technology, I spend most of my time like speaking in high schools, middle schools, education conferences, things like that, um, trying to just very plainly tell these kids like, hey, look, obviously technology can be great. Of course, there's some things about social media that are fun. Um, we haven't been particularly honest about some of the ways that this is designed um, that isn't really for you, but is using you as not the customer, but the product. And then I just show very clearly like, look, this is some of the stuff that's happening. And, the, and in some ways it inspires a sense of rebellion of like, hey, like, I don't want to be used this way um, and lets the kids think for themselves a little bit more about do I, am I using technology or is technology using me? And I'm currently working on a curriculum uh, that gives like the baseline skills of like self-awareness, emotional yeah. awareness, how to plan your day and like plan your weeks to give these like these baseline skills so you can notice what technology takes away. And then that also teaches a different way of looking at social media, different ways of looking at your phone. Um, so that's where my focus is currently with the organization. Just thinking like, all right, let's do some focus on the next generation and see if we can inspire that way and of course like our children is a big lever and the things people care about as a united front so it doesn't feel like i'm doesn't feel like we're it's us versus them it's like we all obviously yeah, want yeah. what's best for the kids yeah. um and so that's where a lot of my attention has been personally on 
on this work. I was just imagining thousands of Maxes across the high schools and middle schools <laughs> around the world giving this talk because it's so damn important. Uh, even that little spark that you gave me, it was, in, it was seeing these middle and high school students seeing themselves in the mirror as using these products for the addictive ways that they were designed and then them realizing that better that itself is so critical just them realizing that they themselves are are following it too addictively and that they can be better users of the digital technologies and you speak that little spark under their booties is so important yeah. for yeah the most powerful moment that accomplishes that um and it's and all of us in it's so much easier to make any kind of change about the stuff in groups it's very hard especially for kids to just all of a sudden be like you know what like i'm not going to use snapchat anymore i'm not going to use instagram anymore or i'm going to use them less it's like if you're the only one it just sucks to be sitting while everyone around you is doing that and you just feel left out um so in groups is really powerful but so when i'm in schools the most powerful moment i think of the talks is i say raise your hand if you use snapchat and every hand in the room goes up Keep your hand up if you use streaks. Every hand just about, like a couple go down, but every hand goes up, just stays up just about. And, then and the take, streak is when you keep in touch with a person uh, every day, you get a streak. Right, when you point. send a message back and forth within 24 hours, the streak builds. So it's like, we have sent two messages, three messages, and more sort of like emojis go, and you, you start to not want to lose that streak. And it's like a, some people are on a hunt, multi-hundred day streaks. Totally. And they um, go on camping trips teenagers. into the woods, and they don't have service, so they leave their phones with their friends so that they don't lose their streaks. Right, so their stuff. friends will just like take pictures of a wall yeah. and yeah. send them back and forth to keep the streak going. Um, and so yeah, I say like, keep your hand up if you use streaks, just about every hand, and then I say keep your hand up if you like using streaks, and just about every hand goes down. Um, in middle schools, usually half the hands go down. In high schools, so just about all the hands go down. Um, and so they collectively can see, like around the room, it's like, oh yeah, we are all doing this thing like, that we don't really like doing. Um, Whoa. Which is like a powerful <laughs> moment. Yeah. And then, and that's often the, some of the positive feedback I get from talks. It's like, oh, like the, like, the cool junior kids ended their Snapchat streaks. And like, because what I, we talk about there is, okay, like obviously this thing has started to feel very real, like, hey, like, are we friends if we don't keep our streak going? Am I popular, right? Popular in high school is the whole thing. Am I popular if I don't have a lot of streaks? And so these metrics that are made, not with ill intentions most of the time, just, hey, people like sending messages, let's gamify it. Yeah. And that process all of a sudden becomes very real to, hey, like, it impacts very real relationships and friendships. Um, and so like just recognizing together that like, well, that's silly, like obviously that shouldn't be the case. I think at least temporarily helps rethink what that is. I would love to do more long-term follow-up of how this yeah, is yeah. affecting kids, but yeah. it's it's early for uh, for me in that way. I would love to hear more uh, of these transitioning moments for the youth, like you just explained that. Uh, how many of you use streaks? How many of you like streaks and the hands go down? Uh, how many more of those can we create? Yeah, um, because then those will those help them realize, oh my gosh, we don't even like using the streaks. Right, and then I'm going to stop my streaks. And then what's the next thing they're going to do? Is potentially slow down on the use of Snapchat or, or Instagram. Maybe they should draw more, or make more music, or make more videos that are educational in some ways, etc. There's tons of options. Yeah, I mean, it's it's this is hard here because we get into that line of like how much of this is like is reasonable to ask of a person or a child um, in terms of their own self-control because that is, I agree it's important to spur these things but also it's so hard when so much of our lives and so much of our social lives for adult like literally most of our work like is in within these devices one way or another yeah. um, it's like and when they're not designed to like protect our human vulnerabilities it's just so hard to have any kind of real deep work focused attitude with these devices it's like we're fighting the machine for that. Um, and so especially for kids, I think like, I would love for these spurred moments to be like all it takes, but it really has to come from both sides. Yeah. Um, sure. And the, uh, another, like, another one is having them in groups for a week, delete social media from their phones. Mm -hmm. um, and like, at, when you first bring that up, it's like, yeah, I say like, you could just delete this from your phone. You don't have to have it on there. And that's always like, oh, whoa, 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 we can't mm -hmm. delete social media from our phones. But I think usually the impetus that helps is like, do you really not want to know what life is like 
without social media on your phone. It's like one week, like you're gonna have your that's whole right. life with that's the option. Right. That's right. But do you not wanna know what it feels like that's a good one. to not have it on your phone and sort of create it like a challenge that it's way. It's a challenge, yeah. yeah. It's like to turn turn it off for a week and see what the difference is like and maybe write about what the difference is like. Sure, yeah, that's it could be a good exercise Yeah, too. that's a good exercise. Make a video about what it was like and put that onto YouTube and Instagram <laughs> right. afterwards. Put, put it on Snapchat, yeah, put it on yeah, Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I wanna, I wanna I want to move into, sure. um, we, were, we started talking about this earlier with how there is a, a, a zero-sum game going on with, with the attention economy, that there is only 16 hours of waking attention per human per day, you spend eight hours sleeping, and then there is about 7.7 billion people on the planet, so there's somewhere around... 120 plus billion hours of collective human attention as a cake on the planet. And then the YouTube algorithms and Facebook algorithms, etc., are all in these streak designs in Snapchat. They're all trying to keep you more tied onto screens because their business models are tied with making money for their shareholders and for their company based on advertising revenue. And so this sort of attention economy plus the business models of time and money being intertwined rather than designing technology to help humanity thrive is one of the biggest issues. I believe so. I believe that's right at the center of it. Um, the most convincing frame of this that I've heard is that like the moment, so autoplaying videos is an example. The moment someone like YouTube figures out, hey, if we autoplay videos, we get about 10% more attention. Um, like, okay, great, like that works, let's do that. And so when I was working for a social media startup, we certainly found that, that when you autoplay videos, like that grabs more attention. And so if that works, and all of a sudden someone like YouTube implements that, um, everyone else has to look at that zero sum cake and say, hey, like YouTube just deployed this new trick that works and it takes 10% more attention. They're eating my market share. Like, I need more of that person's time. I can't look at you as a human being with hopes and dreams in that moment. It's like, I, that's, you're stealing my time. I need that time back. So then Facebook has to autoplay videos in their newsfeed. And then, you know, Netflix also, auto, like everyone starts to fight in this same game for how do we grab as much attention as possible. And Tristan talks about it as reaching down the brainstem and grabbing as much attention as we possibly can. And so yeah, that's, and I think we've like, it's, you know, I don't believe that Facebook right now has designed an algorithm that is perfectly maximized to steal as much attention as possible. I don't think they're doing that anymore. Um, I think they have taken a step back, but should it turn out that the best thing for people is to like, you know what, like turns out spending 75% less time on Facebook is like, is what makes people feel most alive and thriving and happy. Yeah, yeah. Can they really make changes like that in the business model that we have right now? The answer is no. And so then, so this is a crucial point. So it's like, if we measure human thriving and human well-being and flourishing across so many different facets of finding meaning in life, me building really strong relationships with with our families and our friends, and we see that we the more that the the business models must change on the social media companies in order for the flourishing to actually happen. So the, the time that we get sucked away into social is taking us away from creative endeavoring and meaning and so many other uh, crucial things. So then there has to be a business model shift. There has to be a shift towards flourishing. I think so. And then I don't know if a Facebook or Instagram or Google will ever be able to really do that. Um, I don't We've know if actually this talked one. about, you've talked about it and I've gotten really inspired about this potential idea for a shift as well, is that we don't need to see ads. We don't need to have time on screen be the best measure for their revenue. It can actually be based on me paying five dollars a month or ten dollars a month to use these services to not only not see ads but also for them to build out functionalities that enable me to say i only want to use this for x yeah, amount of minutes i want my data i want my facebook connection network graph and i want to see how often i'm connecting and talking to people in a way that is visualized 
in a beautiful way. Sure, and so yeah, visualizing that could be part of it. I could see that. Um, but yeah, the key thing to think about is that it, you're not paying for like, oh, so I don't see ads anymore. Like, it's like, sure, yes, but what you're really paying for is for these algorithms to put you first. It's yes. like to actually yes. think about your life, think about what is like, how do I live for me? How do I live the way that I want to live? Yes. Joe Edelman, who helped coin time well spent with Tristan, like really believes the answer is in human values and helping people live by their values. Talks about how oftentimes we get to our goals and then we think like, oh, like, well, I'm here and now what? That didn't feel as good as I thought I did. But if we like, oh, like I really wanted to show up this into this interview with presence and with um, like thoughtfulness. And if I show up that way, then I feel good about showing up that way. And so Joe dreams of a world where these algorithms are helping people discover and unlock what our values are, the ways that we feel good about how we showed up, regardless of outcome, regardless of other people are doing it with us, and helping us live that way more often and more freely and with more options. Um, but so yeah, I would absolutely pay for services that are really helping me do that. And this is yes. the challenge because yes. Facebook, Google have the data to do that well right now, just about no one else does. Um, and so like, I would love for the next wave to be thinking this way. To, it's like, if you're not doing it well, it's just kind of annoying. Yeah, um, so yeah. it's like, it's, it needs to happen well. And I would absolutely pay for services that are really helping me be a better me in a me way that too. I decide. Yeah. Me too. And we see tons of people paying upwards of, you know, 50 bucks a month for different subscriptions to things like uh, Premiere, uh, which uh, um, uh, gives you video editing abilities, um, you know, Adobe's Creative Suite, um, or, um, you know, MailChimp for managing your mail list. You know, different people, people are paying ton, the, in the tens of dollars a month. It would be easy if, if you, if the, the large giants made that much money off their two billion users that a billion of them would pay them 10 bucks a month 10 billion dollars a month could get you the best engineers and designers to maximize the thriving yeah. of the values of the of each individual that is using I, th these I think there's a business model there it also there's there a whole yeah. inequality question that happens like this is not perfect like there's other oh, things yeah, that, some people can't afford the right but like but if yeah. this thing that I'm talking about that helps me be a better happier more fulfilled version of me I also like all of the money that I give to charity every year like that feels like heck of a place to give is to help people who can't afford it be better versions of themselves like in such an intimate oh, integrated way so then there's a you know, there's the charitable aspect of it um, that's a good charity yeah. or like or yeah, I mean even like a one for one model type thing right of like of being it I would happily to like pay just in my like as I'm paying for that that's service right. for someone who can't for afford someone that can't too afford and it, yeah okay Max let's talk about the actual design of the tech we've been talking about it quite a bit but i want to specifically talk about things like the um the the, the, the we're, we're we're finding ourselves more and more in echo chambers and that's been the worst i think one of the worst things is that we're no longer even having a civil discourse with people that think differently than we do about hey you know I have deep empathy for you. I want to know how you got to where you got in your life. What stimuli did you absorb to get where you are? Now it's that I never ever see opposing viewpoints ever in my conversations with other people, in my news feeds, because I'm constantly fueled into staying in a silo of information. That's tribalizing us in much more serious ways. And even further is that so when you look things up sometimes you can see different results based on where you're located based on your likes so so this is nuanced and challenging because i mean because we are we're actually seeing we're seeing i believe on average more viewpoints um of like things that we didn't believe yeah but we're seeing them for the most part in ways that like that cement the thing that we already do believe um like i you know it's very easy to see the online right now the people who are saying the ridiculous outrageous thing that is so infuriating and like I'm exposed to that viewpoint um, but I'm being exposed to the viewpoints that like just piss me off I'm like how could they think this and like I think further isolate me into my side and in some ways it feels like we're in like you're each in our own echo chamber of like as we consume more and more information through screens and uh, Zainab Tufekci talks about this really beautifully about how um, when she was researching uh, the Donald Trump rallies, she would, uh, she would watch a whole bunch of the videos on YouTube about Donald Trump and about those rallies, and then she would be pushed 
towards more and more videos about white uh, about white supremacy. It's not the same thing. White supremacy and being a Donald Trump, Trump supporter are not the same thing. But in the YouTube algorithm, there was just a natural push towards the more extreme view of something that kind of fits within that category. And then with Bernie Sanders' videos, it was the same for towards the conspiracy left. Um, and this isn't just politics. It's like this is the algorithm figuring out human behavior and pushing us more extreme versions of what we're likely to believe. You look for vegetarian videos, you're pushed towards veganism. It's like you're never hardcore enough for YouTube. You're never hardcore enough for this whole internet system. And so like it becomes very hard to engage with people when whatever we're prone or likely to believe, we're pushed towards more extreme versions of that. And then anyone who doesn't believe that our way that the world is melting is the way the world is melting, um, it's like, well, they just don't get it. How do, how do they not get it? I can't really, like, you just don't see, you just don't know. You don't see what I see, you don't know what I know. And it's hard to, like, it's hard to relate to that person because we've, we're all being pushed constantly towards the extremes of our ideas. Um, and it's a bit like, and uh, there was one other thing that you mentioned, filter bubbles, and what was one other thing I wanted to clarify? Oh, search, like within search. Like, yeah, Google patches things very quickly. Of like, I've, like, I think there's much less of, I search one thing, you search another thing than there was in the past. But it's very, very hard in, uh, like, new news event happens. Like, live scenario, something is going on right now. You have lots of people searching right now. Google has no time to like with all of the things that are happening in different areas of the world that are being searched heavily, how could one like possibly um, like just patch all of the different misinformation, all of the different like chaos that's happening in that moment of like a new search term that didn't have any context with it before. So you've got that like the speed problem of we have this urge, we have this like something's happening, I wanna know. What do we actually learn when we're following these things live? Like there's very, like it's more just entertainment. We're like, oh my God, something's happening and I'm watching. We learn very little from like the, the sparse bits of information we're picking up, but there are lots of people who are checking that out and tons of misinformation happens over Google and over all the platforms. I think that way in the very fast, um, in the very fast events. And like these are not easy problems to solve, like at all. Like how, how do you fix yeah. that? I don't know. I don't know how you fix yeah. that. Um, but if I were running Google, I would have gigantic teams who are dedicated to just that. And it feels like much less of the priority um, than so many other things that are involved with growth and profit maximization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, this it's a it's like keeping the company sustaining with profit but also figuring out how to get that profit most effectively with balancing the human flourishing and human values oh it's a, yeah it's such a super it's tough yeah. and I, like i really hope, so apple is my one like i really hope apple can step up for us because it seems to most of i think something like 90 percent of apple's revenue comes from hardware and not from mm -hmm. like i ads yeah yeah um and so and to be able like to have them be a gatekeeper for us so that companies that are doing like to really be thinking hey like how helpful for you is like seeing news the moment it happens like how is that serving you like is and maybe it is but like can you go through some kind of process to really think about whether that's the case yeah. and then if that isn't the case then like maybe the apps that do that or the systems that do that aren't pinging you all the time but are kind of relegated within the app store or relegated within your phone um, and other things that are serving you better based on the way you decide um, not like one person decides from here this is what a good life is and go like i do believe we need that kind of choice and ability to figure it out for ourselves um, but can someone like apple help us find that and help protect us from the things that we might like that our imp more impulsive yeah, yeah, yeah. selves might uh, very often push us towards. And this is a lot of this is also about the young people that can build the next versions of the hardware and software and the apps and the business models that they get to creatively brainstorm and figure out what's the next best way to build that maximizes flourishing. And I hope so. The psychometric side of things is very crazy too that you are better known now by your 300 Facebook likes than you than your spouse knows you or even with 10 likes better than your coworker knows you. And so that sort of footprint is why don't we have access to these footprints, these psychometrics? Why can't I see how I'm being profiled on the internet? These are ways that we can better understand ourselves through getting access to the data that we actually create. 
but that is being used to s sell us ads and hmm. place us in the buckets. The psychometric side of things is, what are your thoughts on psychometrics? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's, cause there was that Kaczynski study that, that I think actually ended up being fed into a lot of the Cambridge Analytica stuff, which I don't know that much about, to be honest. Um, but I, it did seem like in that study from just like page likes, um, these were like, yep. you like Metallica, whatever, like those yep. type of likes, not the literal things you press like on in your yep. feed. And if you think about what Facebook actually has on you, it's everything you've ever clicked on, scrolled through, hovered over, like, like, share, comment, how long you've spent stalking your ex-boyfriends and girlfriends on Instagram and on Facebook. Like all of that data is collected by Facebook and we yeah. don't have that. And Kaczynski didn't have that. Um, but with just page likes, he was able to make yeah. certain calls about us better than we knew ourselves. Um, and so like that is, that is wild. And actually I actually love what uh, Yuval, uh, Yuval Harari yeah. talked about about this, where he talks about how when he, he's, he's gay and when he came out of the closet, he spent the next six months looking back and thinking like, how did I not know this thing about, like this obvious thing about myself? Like how did I not realize that? He talks about how when you're a baby, like your mom knows you better than you know yourself. And then you get to know yourself better than your mom knows you. Mm -hmm. But now we're kind of in this race to know ourselves better than technology knows us, and that's a tough race. Yeah. And one of the things that he, he talks about as well, he's like, it feels like any sort of out, like an eye tracking software could have probably given me a pretty reasonable probability like that I was, my eyes were going to shirtless men faster than shirtless women. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. like, yeah. what would it have been like for A, for, to get a notification one day saying, hey, there's an 85% probability that, like, that you might be gay. Like, just wanted to let you know what would that world look like. Yeah. And also, what would it look like for Coke to be serving him shirtless men ads, because they knew, and Pepsi would be serving him shirtless women ads, and him just not really sh be sure why he liked Coke a little bit better than he liked Pepsi. Sure, sure. Um, and so he talks about this race to know ourselves. And so as an individual, one of the best things we can do to combat this is like really get to know our triggers, get to know who we are. Um, and it's, you know, it's a losing battle in some ways because this stuff knows so much about us and it's going so fast. But I do think it's, an, it's meaningful and important work in my own life anyway to try and get to know like what's going on on the inside because others are trying to figure yeah. that out too. Yeah. What is your full divine potential here on earth? How can you best understand thyself? But you also gave these great examples of technology helping us understand ourselves. And that was really interesting because there's so much potential for that. Sure. Yeah. And that's the good side of tech. Yeah, I guess. I mean, what would it look like if like, I mean, I, just, I can't even really, I don't know. I don't know what it would look like for Facebook to be using all that data to like steer me in a direction that I choose towards a specific outcome or towards a specific way of being or value set that I have, that it's helped me figure out or that I've figured out. And the complex questions that come with these sort of ideas, like this is not perfect by any means, but it feels to me so obviously better than what exists now. And whoever has access to the large data set of biometrics on our bodies and be able to leverage things like heart rate or pupil dilation or what not, what not with the front facing cameras, that that also makes a, a tremendous difference on hopefully they're, they're benevol it's a benevolent technology. Hopefully it's the, there for the betterment of our, our, us to figure out also ourselves. Also it needs to be a benevolent it, it technology, needs, It right? needs to be, and yeah, you're right. And it it's, needs it's scary because who, who do you trust and like who are gonna be the hopefully benevolent overlords of who's running these and who's collecting these data. And that's why, like, as you've mentioned here, like these advertising models are not really in our favor as we yeah. speed in that direction. So we really need to set up systems so that the people collecting these data even have the opportunity to be benevolent because in this system, they do not. There's a big push for opening up the data silos and letting data flow better. So I think one of the first steps is gonna be, um, I think the decentralization of the data and enabling the data to flow and then when that sort of potentially like encrypted anonymized data can flow more easily, then the uh, then also simultaneously figuring out the business model side of things on potentially having people like us pay 10, 20, 30, whatever bucks a month to gain access to 
um, them helping make the algorithms for our own flourishing, those things kind of smash together would make it more so, okay, now we're collecting the your biometric data, again, encrypted, decentralized, anonymously. And then when we are, we're gathering that, now we're incentivized also, just like all the other big data giants are, is to not keep that data siloed. It's to provide it with a maximal level of flourishing for you. It's going to take us a while to get there, but there's not really that much time to to get there. We need leadership to stand up and say that you know these. If the big, if Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon, um, if they if they and Tencent and Alibaba, if these big giants across China and the United States, if they kind of if they kind of opened up Baidu, if they opened up their their um, their hearts to want this faster and they created a coalition like the United Nations potentially, the United Technology f- Companies, that they could make this change as like a first principal pillar of their organizations. It would just, again, it would be very difficult on the revenue side of things where things would go from there, but doing it all together could be a good way to do it rather than um, having like seven of them looking at one that's trying to do it and be like, we're not going to do that. We need to make money. So it's, I mean, it's certainly, it's it said a lot in there. Um, there's certainly, it's, it's hard to just make that change and switch over. I also don't think it's clear for many what that change really is or what that change really looks like. Um, it's like definitely in this, at the core, thinking about people differently. Uh, but also like, if we, so a lot of people are like, we need to break up Facebook, we need to break up these big companies. I mean, right now, at least we know where to look. <laughs> you know, like, it, I think decentralizing and encrypting all of this data and information, like, also in theory, it's like, okay, you can start to see how that creates a better world. But also, just like the same problems we have, but now everywhere, like, feels even more chaotic to me, too. So it's, it's really, it's, it's challenging to think about, um, like, can we actually solve the, what's at the root of these problems of thinking about people differently rather than looking at it as, oh, okay, let's just, let's decentralize that information. Um, and then like Facebook isn't the only one who has it. So everybody has it. Uh, and it's like, it's tough to even know where to look or where to go. And I, it's, we're honestly, we're like, we're thinking now further ahead than I can kind of see clearly yeah, yeah, um, to yeah, how that's going to yeah. look when it, yeah, yeah. when, it, if or when it does all break away that way. But like, I think the key here is about genuinely thinking about like the incentive model, the incentive structures and like aligning our goals with the goals of, of what That's people right. are creating um, to be able to really push us in a direction that's going to feel good because like just being like, okay, what, just changing like the way the data is distributed or things like that don't necessarily solve the, yeah. the core problems. Yeah. I love how much time you've spent on this. And okay, let's, let's talk about kids. And children, you, you're going around and speaking and you're getting kids to really realize like, oh shit, yeah, we, we really don't like the streak feature. We really don't, um, we don't, we haven't taken a week away from social media to see what that feels like. Um, there's more and more research that's coming out about, about uh, depression, about anxiety, about suicide rates, about the fear of missing out, about what it's like if you, you got to take millions of photos of your own face throughout throughout your life and try and find the best ones that if you're so distracted that you're checking it so the phone so often when are you focused on your own creative endeavoring focused on gaining empathy and social skills so this is a serious effect for children growing up absolutely and it's and so the research side of this is very hot it's very challenging and also it's an important point because in my experience, the people, especially at Facebook and at some of these bigger companies, are trying to be very research driven and very data driven. Um, and some of the research being like, look, depression is skyrocketing, like isn't particularly robust. Like it's, it's definitely a thing to look out for and pay attention to, but I, I'm not sure that it's like convincing. Um, but that, I mean, like that said, uh, I mean, I, I do believe that if we were able to have more serious and robust research, I think we would absolutely, especially with Instagram, find like all the self-comparison leading to mental health issues and depression and things like that. Um, but, and also that said, like in terms of looking at the research here, 
what's going to actually happen for any kind of longitudinal study you're looking at you have okay let's say we're trying to go three years um, three years you have a child going from one stage of development to another by three years you have a completely different tech ecosystem things are working in a totally new way and so you have to challenge the effects between those two things it's just it's going to be really hard yeah. just like period to find any kind of reliable research about anything in this field which is really tough it's like a tough place to where we can point to be able to point directly to like look like this is a reason this is how this is affecting us um, but absolutely like I, it, it feels so obvious to me some of the things that we're losing and that we need to think about this more cautiously and more skeptically. My advice to schools is to like, to like we had for a while, the ethos was like, great, like an iPad in every hand, like perfect. Like now we have these new tools, this new innovative technology in the classroom, all the beautiful advantages, how wonderful. And yes, there are some beautiful advantages, but we just didn't really think about what we were losing as we were putting that in the classroom. And so I think a much better attitude is like, okay, um, let's look and assume that 99% of the new ed tech that's coming in like doesn't actually help or isn't really going to be effective, isn't going to create new problems to introduce this environment. Let's look at it as a skeptic and really be like, prove to me, like show me that this actually really learns, yeah. really helps kids learn, really helps improve, um, and use that skeptical eye. Mm -hmm. um, the way I see it, we have an opportunity for like a seven hour period during the day to teach children, focus patients, and how to be without mm -hmm. their devices. Mm -hmm. um, with exceptions, like of course with exceptions, there's certain special ed programs that have been proven to be really effective using technology, um, like certain vulnerable populations, like trans students, um, like have found social media to be a really positive source of support. And of course there should be like some classes and some things where you really do use the phones and do use, um, do use tech that way. But it feels like the, the standard should be, like that's the exception and not the rule. Um, and like, are we really at risk of kids not knowing how to use these devices or not as soon as they get out of school being totally on them all the time? It's like, can we, can we use that period in school to teach this thing that they really otherwise might not understand or learn? Yep. <sighs> I'm it, laughing at your deep breath. <laughs> yeah. Max likes to start his talks by uh, having deep breaths yeah. feel the humanity. And this is a really important time to take a deep breath because we're talking about children and children are the, the future leaders and for, for us to see them making duck faces at, at Snapchat. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, and we do, we do stupid, you know, we stressful. all have done stupid stuff as kids too, right? I know, but we, it did, does, we did a, dumb things. I do think yeah. we're in a category shift of what this of yeah. what this is. This yeah, you're is right. not the we same. We did dumb things too, you're but right. But it's not the same. It's not the same. We didn't, yeah. have, we didn't carry around... Our TVs, in 24 our hours a day, yeah, yeah we didn't yeah. have but to go into them to talk to our friends. friends. Was... Yeah, that's right, that's right, the lack of eye contact and um, this 72% of teens think they're being manipulated by technology. That's a really good one that um, Tristan that's, said at the Salesforce that's talk. Said. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. I wonder where that's from. Yeah, um, so he said that at the Dreamforce uh, talk that he gave a couple months ago. Um, so you, we've been talking about some of the um, some of the tools that are um, that are being built. I want us to really highlight some of these um, tools. I, I personally have been using like Facebook Newsfeed Eradicator on uh, desktop, so you don't even see your Facebook Newsfeed. People like that a lot. That's a good one. Um, so is uh, uh, Stanford's Habit Lab is really good. Like they oh, literally interrupt you all the time. Yeah. They'll they'll yeah you're you like type in Reddit or Facebook or Instagram whatever, and they'll just be like. Like, yo, like, what's your objective? How many minutes do you even want to spend on here? Should we just close this tab right now? And it's like, yeah, actually, I didn't want to do this shit. Huh. And sometimes you're like, yeah, I actually need to send a message to someone, so I only want a minute on here. And then you click that. And then it literally, after you, it like logs after 60 seconds, there's a countdown, and it closes the tab. It's like, nope, you're done. Wow. Um, so it's interesting things like that, that, um, again, we're trying to quantify our own habits using these things. Um, so yeah, tell us about some of the ways that you know that you're that you're seeing these uh, ethical tech breakthroughs happen. So yeah, right now it's like a lot of patchwork, right? It's a lot of things like that <laughs> that people are patchwork. <laughs> yeah, like things like Habit Lab are that are doing, and that's cool to hear that's been effective for you. Um, and a lot of this is about finding what does work for you. Uh, 
But yeah, turning off all notifications that aren't from a human being trying to reach you is one that we recommend if you want to go all the way into turning off all notifications. Sounds like that's been cool too. Basically, um, you're talking about the ones where like Facebook's saying like, oh, you have 13 new notifications and it's like trying to reel you in. Twitter's like you totally. have five new notifications trying to reel you in. Totally. And like, you, uh, you know, this person liked your photo even or happy yeah. holidays from Tinder. You haven't played Candy Crush in a while. Like all of those, <laughs> get off, <laughs> turn off those notifications Gosh. for sure. Those are so manipulative. That's like the low-hanging fruit. Those are <laughs> so manipulative. Out of the two billion people that use the smartphone technologies, what percentage of them still have those low-hanging fruit enabled? Because that's a really good question. Because that, if we could just knock that one out of the park first, I feel like it's a question that only the company knows knows yeah. the answer to. Yeah. They're the ones who have that data. I bet it's over fifty percent. I just have a feeling. I that think it most is. people just don't even know to switch into switch your notifications, in a, yeah. or like, or that you can do that, or like the default is what most people do. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, which is that's a big part of the issue. Gosh, it um, just it sounds to me when you say the words. You know, you know, Candy Crush sends you, you haven't played for a while, or Tinder's like, come get your holiday date or whatever. Right. To me, it makes my whole body feel so <laughs> uncomfortable. It makes me feel so bad. <laughs> because we can't be designing technology that way. You know, these shows, even though these shows are never paywalled, completely free, we never expect you to want to watch, you watch it how you prefer to watch it. If you want to watch all hour, great. If you want to watch 30 and 30, great. Do your thing with it. We're not going to send you messages to say, oh, you haven't learned about biotech in a while. Come learn about <laughs> biotech. We'd rather ask you a question like, you know, um, about your life. Like, hey, what are you most interested in learning about right now? Oh, you're interested in biotech? Okay, great. And we'll there's, do an episode on it. We can do right. that. Or there's, you know, a bunch of other news sources that actually talk about biotech as well. So we want to push you into where you're most interested in. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and if in your life, learning is what you want to focus on at this moment. It's like there's a bit, there's lots of ways yes. of thinking about this and going into yes. it. Yes. Yes. Um, Go ahead. But uh, yeah, like learning notification, yeah, it makes you feel bad in your whole body. <laughs> uh, I like that. I like that it does that. Um, I forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, but yeah, the defaults in general, I think, are what most people have on, and that's not great. Yeah. yeah. And then how about um, how about your work? You know, you, you you're going out and speaking um, to middle and high schools. Um, you're also um, other parts of your team are also doing work with the, the corporate and, um, and government side of things. What are you finding to be in a, a good way that they are um, that they're transitioning into ethical tech? Um, that, Most that companies are that yeah, and governments. governments are. Um, I'm just so ignorant on the government side that I don't even want to don't even want to touch Unless it. Unless do companies. Um, yeah, the ways companies are transitioning, uh, it, unfortunately it feels a lot like mostly at this moment, and it, like I think Facebook has absolutely taken steps. Like I think they genuinely care, but it often feels like they're mostly running a PR machine with a lot of this like new problem. And like we're handling, we're hand like trying, it feels like they care more about the PR than solving the issue. Uh, and that makes me sad. Um, yeah. But it's, uh, and actually that was what I was gonna say about the, the dark patterns, is that when I turned off my Facebook notifications, like Facebook got progressively more and more desperate of like to the point of just sending me a text message. I'm just like being like, like hey, like this person, like, like, I forget what it was. It was like I was tagged in a post, you know how sometimes on Facebook people just like tag 15 people and I was tagged in one. And I was getting texts of all the comments of this post. Um, and it then was you had just, to go turn that off. Yeah, which I like, I mean. Just in its own separate I area. I, just, I think I just blocked the, the number. <laughs> um, yeah. I just got frustrated, got angry, like they were still coming after me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, how do you shift towards more ethical tech? And a lot of this is aligning the business model, really thinking deeply and carefully about what it is that the people using your product are there for, um, and making sure that, you're not, that you care more about what they're there for than what you're there for. Those things have to be aligned, and how are you helping? Um, it's just putting the person really first and at the center of this. It's so easy to think, well, we do more good than bad. Like, so we do more good than bad, so it's okay. We'll tolerate some of these, like, yeah, we can do this little thing. Everybody's doing this thing. We'll do this little thing. It's so easy to think that way. Um, it's much harder to really, like, to be, like, to respect somebody's time and attention more than you, like, yeah. 
more than you might want to encroach that might yes. be kind of good for you. But really think yes. with the utmost respect over someone's time and attention. That's such a good way to put it. And that's kind of what we were talking about a moment ago is thinking about what you're building and realizing that your primary goal is to put yourself out there with your content, but you want to respect other people's attention. You want to make yourself known, but you don't want to f- forcibly reel people in. It's not, um, no, it's not, it's not a yeah. good principle to roll off of. Yeah. Um, okay. I want to talk about, so Max, you'll see his, with, the, with the links below. Max's use of poetry and a rhythm and a rhyme in the way that he disseminates ethical technology and a bunch of other really interesting um, video through video as well. Um, tell us about how you latched onto onto that and uh, and sure. and we'd love to do a little uh, a little f- like freestyle or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, but uh, for me, I heard this poet named Inq perform in a friend's. Uh, at a friend's living room actually and I was just really moved I was at that time in the tech world in the storytelling world and I was really surprised at how much I remembered of the rhyme and rhythm and just like how much it stuck with me and on the way home I started writing and the first two lines of what I wrote happened to rhyme and I was like okay let's give this a shot and I've come to realize that I think one of the big draws for me was yeah that rhyme and rhythm just like help us listen in a way that we would not ordinarily and in a distracted ADD world, it seems like a very powerful tool to get a message like in its entirety from where it comes from, like or where it comes from directly to where it needs to go. Uh, and so rhyme and rhythm have been helpful to me in that way. And that is like, I think at, at my core, like I'm trying, to, I'm trying, I like when I, I found, a, sometimes I found, I found it, like I found a thing and I need to show you this thing. Um, and I want you to see this thing the way I see this thing. Yeah. And rhyme and rhythm have been a powerful tool to help me do that. Yeah. 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 Um, there's something also so, you know, you started getting at this, like, we got to figure out new artistic and creative strategies to get content out to people, like through rhyme and rhythm, that can, that can, that can, that can turn people's heads to be like, whoa, that's different than what the majority of things I'm seeing. Maybe I should look over here a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. And that's how we can potentially find um, these new paths of, 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 uh, of engaging with people in ways that are exciting and new. And Yeah, I like yeah. how you do that. Well, I mean, I, it's, I appreciate it. And thank you for the, yeah. the kind words about my work. I appreciate you in that and appreciate you saying that. Um, and it's for me, I would love to see a system where it's like, what, what content is not a human need, right? Like what do you, like what are you looking for in this moment? What are you looking for? How are you looking to be? And if my work can help that, great, have that rise to the top. If other stuff can help that, great, have that rise to the top. But have a different content distribution system that's not just about what grabs attention um, the most effectively, but is about how am I helping you in some way, shape or form with whatever you're like looking for or trying to be in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you know, we're we're all little tiny specks, so we should learn how to better use our tech. You know, there you go. You know, there's like, (laughs) who's the poet now? Who's the poet now, mister? Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want everyone to also, when you, when you go and check out some of the videos below, um, with this panda is dancing the video, there's this really interesting moment about the realization that if tech helped make us more human that we would we would we would potentially get that flower that we need to give to someone really cool that we meet on the streets in just a click of a button that in subway love that you would realize that the people standing next to you on the subway as everyone's just engrossed in their own worlds that those might be our potential future lover or our future business partner or someone that's a really good friend potentially of ours in stop making murders famous you realize that you are we need to stop putting the names of the people that are committing the atrocities anywhere period and that only only when you're still trying to find them um but besides that there's no point and um and that way um there's no increase in clout for more people to follow a phenomenon that's similar um to that so i want you guys to all check out those videos um max what's a core driving principle of yours um to try and tell the truth, um, to try and uh, 
uh, to try to tell the truth, try to be impactful, to yeah, it, you know, it changes all the time. But like that right now, um, honesty and impact are very much central in my life. And if you could rebuild civilization from scratch, how would you design it? Wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what we're kind of, that's what we're talking about. That's what this whole thing has been about. Uh, and I would be designing it so that I think, I mean, I wouldn't design it myself. <laughs> uh, I would be trying to gather people who have thought deeply about what makes living meaningfully. Um, what lives a meaningful life and how I would think of try to have everybody work together to create those things. Um, I think in some ways like capitalism naturally has encouraged a lot of positive behaviors for a long time, negative as well. But so like some systems just tend to work to create meaningful society and capitalism's got us a long way. It's got its problems, but it's got us a long way. I'm grateful that I don't have to rebuild society and civilization from scratch. It's too much pressure of an, of an answer. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I know some of the things to think about, and that's what we've been talking about. Yeah. And do you think this is a simulation? Um, how do you define a simulation? How you would define one? <laughs> uh, I totally, well, but no, I want to know what you mean by simulation. Is this a base reality or is this a simulation? Like in simulation theory? Yeah. Uh, I think there are like infinite possibilities of what reality is. Um, an infinite, I, b I believe in a multiverse. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I believe from what I understand of that, <laughs> of that theory. Um, but I think... And whether like whether or not it's a simulation, it seems like it doesn't matter. Like we're here, we're now, or wherever you are, you're there, you're now, and like that last moment is gone. Like now we're in a new moment, new and moment. now we're in a new moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's where that's where I'm at right now. But it's funny. I'm very aware of the cameras of like I'm, I don't have I don't know. Like this past stuff we've been talking about, I know a lot about. I don't know if we're yeah, yeah, in a simulation. Yeah. I don't know exactly what the nature of reality is. I'm trying to figure it out. You're a video game character that is working on helping this civilization evolved on this rock orbiting this star, figuring out how to help them make ethical tech at this important transitionary moment. Figuring out how to make like the most of our lives and figure out how to see how much fucking beauty there is um, and live that way and right. help each other and tolerate each other. Yeah, those are things I'm trying to do. <laughs> Perfect segue to the last question. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? That we get to be here, that we get to live, that we get to exist, that we get to, yeah, that, that of all the, the, like, that there is anything, that there, that this is, that, like, all of it, that it is, is just remarkably beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Max, this has been super enlightening. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thank really you, Really appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate you having me. Everyone watching, go and check out Max's work in the bio below. Go and check out those links. Also, let us know your thoughts in the comments below about the episode and some of the ethical tech conversation that we've been having. Go and try these little quantified self-experiments and see how you behave differently in the world when you turn off certain sets of notifications or delete apps and just see how you behave differently and measure that better about ourselves. And we help, help us out, help out help out um, the Center for Humane Technology. Um, the links below also help out simulation. The links below, we'd love to continue doing cool things like coming on site and talking to great leaders like Max. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your destiny into the world. Go build, go create. We love you so much and dose up on love. Take care, see you soon. That's it, that's it. Cool. That's how we do. Thanks, man.